Hey everybody, welcome to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your girl, Jessie Mae Peluso. This is a Dr. Peluso episode. If you would like to have your questions answered or get some advice from Dr. P, submit your questions. You can go right to our Instagram story on Sundays or Mondays, slide up in our Instagram story, slide and answer the questions there or submit your questions there. Or you could also email us at Comedy at gmail.com to have your questions submitted that way. Please come see me live. We have two more dates to the end of the year. I'm going to be at the Comedy on the Carlson in Rochester, New York, December 15th, 16th, and 17th with uh, Brendan Donegan. And then I will be closing out the year at the Syracuse Funny Bone, my new tradition, the New Year's Eve party with Jesse Mae Peluso and friends. That's December 30th and 31st at the Syracuse Funny Bone. All tickets can be purchased at jessiemay.com forward slash tour. You can also check the show notes for the links for tickets, y'all. Come see me live. It's going to be a great time. We're working on the special. We're honing it. It's coming together. I also love coming back home and doing my Syracuse jokes, which I can't really do anywhere else. So just indulge me. And I appreciate you guys listening. I can't do this show without you. I read your comments and your reviews. They mean the world. If you could take a second and go leave us a rate or review, we would much appreciate it. And without further ado, this is a Dr. Peluso episode. So I hope you guys sit back, relax, and enjoy all of the unsolicited advice from board uncertified with the PhD and THC, the one, the only, Dr. Peluso. <laughs> Sharp Tongue Podcast. Beep, 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 beep. You're listening to the Sharp Tongue Podcast. I'm your host, Jesse May Jessie Peluso. May. It's a personal look. Well, it's not really a look because it's a podcast. I'm already fucking this up. This is kind of like a verbal comedy diary, a deep look into the crevices of my mind. It's going to get dirty. You might cry. You probably laugh. Hopefully you'll laugh. The whole point is for you to laugh, but you also might cry. I talk about my family. I talk about farts. farts. I talk about love, loss comedy how hard it is to make it in this biz i'm a fucking professional each week it's something different sometimes i have a guest host sometimes it's gonna be a movie companion episode sometimes i just ramble about the bullshit i dealt with the week before you never know what you're gonna get it's raw uncut and funny it's me hey everybody we're here we're recording um let me get my headphones on so i can hear myself hey up in the kitchen studio well the garage studio is being built deb and i are gonna attack it tomorrow clear it out so we can have it built um god my hair looks dusty why does my hair look so dusty it's the problem with having video i i miss just the audio part of podcasting but you know i guess some people want to see my face as well i don't know one thing i do know is i'm having an unsponsored beverage omission which is this like gluten reduced beer. I, I I hate myself even just saying that. Hearing myself say that I hate myself. Let me see if I can open this with these stripper nails. Something happens where you eat a lot of, I, I eat a lot of olive oil. I don't know if you, I don't think you say you drink olive oil, even though it's technically kind of a liquid. It, olive oil is one of those weird middle ground foods. It's like, you don't really drink it. You don't really eat it. You just, it just seeps into you. But because of that, and I think because I'm 40, my nails have grown like some sort of Tasmanian devil. Not an important information at all. Just a little factoid for you guys. So I'm drinking balanced brewing omission. It says good balance and good flavor. I'll be the judge of that. Okay, let's see. Mm, That's a bitch. I mean, that's a crisp. (laughs) Not that's a bitch. That's crisp. That's a crisp bitch, I think is what I meant to say. Oh, it's this light and citrusy. Yeah, it's delicious. I have to condone it. It's a really delicious beer. Mm. What's up, Maybays? How are all my Maybays doing? We have to get the the new show nickname caught on. And I realize that's not how nicknames happen. Usually it's a more natural progression. It's something that happens naturally. It's not forced, but we're going to force it because of my friend. So uh, yeah, it's the Maybays, my co-writer. I wanted to touch back to the fame episode we had the truth about fame podcast episode speaking of my co-writer totally 
slipped my mind to even discuss the show that I'm writing that is about fame. How dumb of me to completely omit that from the conversation. But I, the show that I am creating is a conversation on fame and what it does to people. So it was interesting to have that chat with you guys. I think it was last week, last week's episode where we talked about the truth about fame and what fame does from all those questions we got for Dr. P and how, you know, I, I loved answering these questions because it brings stuff up and, and we get into things like that. And, um, the show that I'm creating is all about the, the downside of fame and, and how people can sort of succumb to it. I think there are certain people who figure out the balance and then there's some people who drown in it. So there's definitely funny scenarios, but also some dark scenarios. So that's that's essentially what my show is going to be all about. And also a quick update on Cuntopia 2022. It is still in full effect. I still feel like a raging um, C-U-N-T. See you next Tuesday. I don't know why. I think I had a theory uh, recently that it might be a new wave of grief. It might be sort of the holiday season. I think I get like this around the holiday season now that everyone's dead. (laughs) Honestly, I think it is grief escaping or grief finding um, a place to be expressed. That's, That's my general... I guess the guess that's my, my best educated guess as to why I'm such a cunt lately. But when food is in my system, I'm fine for the most part, but I'm still kind of, I'm, I'm a little on edge and I'm recognizing that. And I think it's this, the ho- it's the holiday season, a boop de doo and a scoop a dee doo. It's ugh. fuck. The holidays are triggering, aren't they? It should be like, happy holidays. I'm triggered. Where's that coffee mug? The holidays are so triggering. I need a martini. I don't even like martinis. And that's what the holidays do to me. They make me want to drink martinis. I've actually been, am I screaming? I feel like I'm screaming. I should let you guys know I'm on a microdose. I am on a microdose of fun guy, which I can't wait for it to be readily available for people everywhere. I feel like microdosing is some, is such a great medicine. And I, I'm sure that's going to annoy people that just that sentence alone, but it it really is. Anywho, I, um, yeah, the holiday season's triggering. (laughs) It is, it's a triggering time, you know, parents are gone and your emotions want a stage and they will be heard and felt. So Cuntopia 2022, uh, continues. And there is some exciting Netflix news excuse me, I'll let you guys know at the end of the podcast. So stay tuned for that. Also, make sure you email us. Maybase, Maybase, send me a Mayday, an email, comedy at gmail.com. I do get some messages from various people. There is a gentleman by the name of Greg W, who has been rating the podcast for years. Well, not for years, but for a while. And I do look forward to his emails. They're hilarious. And uh, he does not hold back. Uh, And I I love a good constructive criticism. I'm not always going to agree with it, but hey, it's my fucking show. You know, you live and you learn. And you only learn by being open to criticism. And also you stay strong by saying fuck you to critics. I, um, yeah, I'll let you guys know the Netflix news at the end of the podcast. And this is a Dr. P episode. We had so many questions last time. I couldn't get to them. I could not get to them. So let's get into some of these. Let's let's open it light. Trump's strong, Trump strong. Nope. Next. Uh, let's see what we got. We have Nitro Paso, Nitro Paso 24. I love you. You love me? Nope. Don't know ya. Don't have a lot of love to go around. Uh, you know, maybe Jesse May from three months ago would have said, yes, this new Cunty May. Cunty May? Nope. No room for you. Uh, my friend Chris McClure just called. I had to push him to voicemail. I hope he's not too mad about it because him and I are on the brink of dusting off our horror feature to be shopped. And I, I it's one of my dreams to make a horror film. I, when I think about my career and things I want to accomplish, like my 
my career bucket list, a horror film is one of them. And we're very close to this coming to fruition. And I'm speaking it to existence to move it along the cosmic train and to have the universe align what it needs to align for this thing to, to manifest. But back to Nitro Paso, Nitro Paso, I do not love you. I don't. Um, Tony Fat Hands. <laughs> I love the name. Tony Fat Hands says, can you describe Syracuse in three words? Easy. Uh, Columbus Bakery Bread. The dirtiest lake ever. That's four words. Hoffman's hot dogs. That's is hot dog. One word. I'm bad at this. Hoffman's holes. Hoffman's hot dogs. Um, let's see the Syracuse crunch. <laughs> <That's our> hockey <laughs> team. <laughs> we have a hockey team called the Syracuse crunch. I don't even know where they like if they're playing, if it's a thing, if it's still happening. Um, but we do have a hockey team. I believe I went to a hockey game when I was a little girl with my dad and either he caught a puck or somebody behind us sitting in the bleachers caught a puck. And for some reason I got the puck, but I, I don't think my dad caught it. I think somebody else did. And my dad swindled it from them, which sounds like the more likely scenario. Syracuse cold as fuck. Um, my favorite place because I can visit it and leave orange men, pizza and Italians. That's what I think of when I think of Syracuse snow, Italians and sandwiches. So many sandwiches. Um, there's so many different words to describe Syracuse. That's funny. Tony fat hands. I would say cold as fuck because it's, it's literally winter there a majority of the year. It's a little brutal. It's brutality. Uh, let's see what other questions we have. Tina Hughes says, how do we feel about Enrique from the Rosemont show? So Enrique was this, we'll call him a heckler because for the lack of a better term, that's pretty much what he was for my shows in Chicago with Carly. We had shows at uh, Zany's Rosemont, our, our last tour date of the year, Carly and I together. And there was this gentleman named Enrique. His name really pissed me off. His name is Enrique and... He just was one of these types of men that I feel have issues with women in my position doing stand up comedy or just having the floor, if you will. He had an issue with that. It made him feel inferior, or maybe brought up. It was triggering for him, much like women can be in that scenario where you get heckled by women, which I have said on this podcast 99.9% .9 of the hecklers I've had have been women. You know, my girls, oh my God, I'm a, I'm a fucking feminist. No, you're not. No, you're not. You're being loud, disruptive. And, and instead of you working on yourself, you're interrupting my shit. You're the anti-feminist. So this guy is no different. Cut from the same cloth on the separate shirt. Sa same, hey, get, bunny, get off the couch. This is a problem working from home. I got one dog and a fucking cone because Chaplin's butthole, something happened to his butthole last night. My littlest dog's butthole looked like the opening of the universe and I, it scared me. It scared me so bad. It scared me something awful. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's honestly an issue. The, these hecklers are an issue. And Enrique was a son of a bitch. I got to be honest, Enrique was a son of a bitch, but I knew who he was. That's the thing about stand-up comedians is we become so observant of the populace whole as a whole in, in human behavior. We start to understand certain archetypes of people. They don't even need to say much and they say everything. Sometimes it's in the, in, in what they don't say where all the answers lie. You ever realize that about somebody you can just read them like a book and they haven't said a word it's so interesting how, how much people tell you without saying something, if you keep your eyes open and are able to read. And it, it can be exhausting because as a comedian, you want to keep the show going. You want to have it be fun. You want the audience to have a good time. You don't want to alienate the room. But then this motherfucker opens his mouth and you go, oh, I got to get into this. And I don't want to. I don't want to. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I don't indulge that part of me because it's, it requires more discipline 
to stay the course. It requires more discipline to do the, to do the work and to stick with the jokes and stick with the set. But because Tina Hughes asked how I feel about Enrique, I felt like I understood who he was. And that's why I kind of went in on him. I'll put the audio of Enrique on my Patreon. I, I am posting again on my Patreon. Thank you for all of my Patreon OG fans that are there waiting patiently. We are posting regularly on the Patreon page. So check it out. I will put the Enrique audio on Patreon for next week. You guys can listen to it after we uh, load the show up. I'll put it up this weekend. I'll find it. And you can see what I said to him. I don't know if you're going to be able to hear him as much. I, I sometimes will repeat what the person says just so the audience has the reference. It's a, it's a lot going on. You're juggling a lot. It can be, it's so stressful. You're up there, you're trying to work on your set. And for me, somebody who hasn't had a special yet, I'm still honing my special and working on the jokes for that. And then I have to juggle noises in the room and then people who want to be a part of the show. And it can throw a bitch off. Sometimes you got to go into the room. Sometimes you got to chop up the room. When the room talks to you, you can't always ignore it. Sometimes it's so loud, it disrupts the flow and you might as well just go with it anyways because the flow is fucked up. It's fucked up as it is. So we had to go in with Enrique. And you guys can listen to that on the, on the Patreon. I, I go in. You know, I go in. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, uh, Tigers 55 says, favorite Thanksgiving food to overindulge. I think I answered this one on the last podcast. Let's do the other one. Um, here we go. The Jackson. Will you get Carly to explain why bitches love Pete Davidson, please? Wow. That's rude. First of all, I'm not dragging my girl Carly into this. It's not her responsibility to explain Pete, the Pete David, Davidson phenomenon. It is not Carly Aquilino's responsibility to explain that phenomenon, but it is a phenomenon and it's not something that's unfounded. I think when I think about the Pete Davidson effect, the PDE, um, or BDE as people are calling it, it is an interesting effect, but I don't think it's something that is profound. It's something that's existed in, 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 it's been in existence since humans have been on earth. It's, it's called like mating coping, like the coping. Oh, now I got to Google this. It's like the mate. It's like when we, um, when people basically are attracted to someone over and over, it's like a trend, you know, it's like how, how fashion trends happen. Um, mate choice, coping, copying. That's why I couldn't think of it. There's too many big words. <laughs> Mate choice copying. That's what it's called. It's a process of choosing a mate based on the observation and acceptance of mates beforehand by others. So all these women have accepted Pete Davidson. And of course, other women are going to be like, oh, okay, well, if this girl thinks he's good, then he must be good. And we do that so that we're accepted by the tribe. We don't want to be left behind, right? Most of what we do is, is an attempt of acceptance and connection. So we're not left behind. It's all linked to survival. So bitches are just trying to survive. That's the Pete Davidson effect. They're just out here trying to survive. <laughs> it's uh, let me, I'll read this article. Let's see. I'll have a real scientist explain it. Biologically, we're designed to actually care about what other people think. There are strong social reasons to actually belong to a group because humans are inanely group driven, innately group driven. Exactly. So the psychologist says a big part of mate choice copying goes back to the caveman days and the fundamental human need to be accepted by the tribe. There we go. It's all about the tribe, the tribe. I cannot talk today. Can I ever talk? I feel like words kind of slip out of my mouth re really easily, but yeah, that's basically it. it. Bitches are just trying to survive and, and not get thrown out by the tribe. So this mate choice copying is what's going on with Pete Davidson. And it's only going to uh, snowball more and more and more and his teeth will get nicer and his skin will get clearer and he'll look healthier. That's just what happens. And I wish him the best. I think he's, you know, he's, he's been doing it. I've known him since he was like 16 and good, good for him. Good for him. Taking a world tour of all these beautiful women. Life is short. Hop on the ride, ladies. Enjoy it. Don't try it. Don't become unattached to the outcome with Pete. I think that's Pete's become like the new Disney world. 
you go, you spend a couple days with the family, maybe not the family, but you go with the family, you take photos, you get some snacks, you take a couple rides, maybe, you know, go for a little hike around the corner here and look at some cool little photo ops, take some pictures, and then you leave the fucking park. That's it. You can't stay in the park overnight. Some other family is going to come tomorrow. You need to make room for the next family. Pete Davidson is, he's, he's an amusement park. He's, he's not, you know, it's something to enjoy and then leave behind. So have fun while you can ladies. Cause there's a, there's a line of women behind you. You hear that Emily Raj, gosh, 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 bagosh, ski. What's her name? I wish everybody the best. That was me not being cunty. I'd like to say that I, I think I impressed myself in that moment. I actually was being genuine because I do care about Pete and I hope he's doing well. I love to see him enjoying the finer things of, of in life. Um, let's see what else we have here. Uh, TCMA, why are you so dang sexy? That might've been asked last week, but we can ask it again. Why am I so dang sexy? TCM, T -T -T TMC, Ma 14. I don't know why I'm so dang sexy. I don't necessarily consider myself sexy. I mean, there's moments where I feel sexy, but I don't consider myself like sexy. I just think I am what I am. I sound like Popeye, but um, there's cer certain moments where I feel sexy. You know when I feel sexiest? No makeup. No makeup feels the best to me. I feel like um, being in your natural skin is a rebellion. Remember uh, who did that? Uh, Alicia Keys. She didn't wear makeup for a long time. And, and she didn't need to. That girl's bone structure, she, she does not need makeup. Other bitches like us, someone needs to draw on bone structure. Literally, makeup creates bone. <laughs> you sit in the chair and then you're like, oh shit, now I have cheekbones and a nose? Okay. Oh, cr it's interesting. This beer is really delightful. I, I, I didn't necessarily need it, but I just wanted something cold and delicious. Thank you for the compliment of saying I'm dang sexy. I appreciate it. I feel sexiest when I don't have anything on my face like Alicia Keys, even though I don't have an Alicia Keys face. I love her. And um, that reminded me back to my uh, drinking conversation we kind of tapped into earlier on in the podcast. I, I haven't really been drinking much at all. I, I think we talked about it. I didn't drink at all for Thanksgiving. I had like a small tequila in the morning. That's right. We did talk about my morning tequila. What a, that's like the most drinker thing to say. I'm not drinking at all. I did a shot at 8 a.m. Don't be judgy. It was the holiday season. It still is. So those 8 a.m. shots are right around the corner because the holidays are triggering. Up on Netflix, streaming this holiday season, triggered a new Christmas classic. <laughs> <laughs> that actually would be hilarious. A movie called Triggered. Uh, and it's the next Christmas classic. That's really fucking funny. Um, I'm, if I do say so myself, but my relationship with alcohol has completely changed. It's the first time that I can remember celebrating a holiday and not drinking, except for the 8 a.m. tequila shot, you judgmental whores. And it's interesting that the evolution around it, I, I was uh, having a conversation with Rogan about that today you know, cause he microdoses as well. We were talking about, excuse me, microdosing and MDMA. Cause I'm going to do MDMA for the first time. I think this weekend, um, I've never done it before. And my neighbor, Doug gave me this pill that looks like something that turns you into, uh, the incredible Hulk. So we'll TBD on that. Um, guys will have to come back for the follow-up on that situation. But I was talking to Rogan about it and he was giving me advice and we were talking about drinking and he just got off sober October, October, obviously they had their recap and I had my little mini recap and I had told him that I also did sober October for the first time. And we both agreed the juice isn't worth the squeeze. We've talked about it on the podcast and it's interesting to come around on a different side of your relationship with drinking to evolve that. And, and it happens, I think, naturally, as you get older, your relationship with a lot of things evolve, your relationships with people, your friends, your, your 
romantic relationships, it all evolves as you evolve into, you know, who you're going to become as you involve in, into the adult that you are going to become or are becoming things, things, your relationships are different. They're constantly changing. And I think for the better, I think as you become a little bit older, you become less dependent and you, you start to shed the things that sort of have weighed you down in the past, your doubt and your negative self-taught and your mindset, everything sort of evolves. And it's really freeing. Uh, it is really freeing to become an adult, not without pain. That's why they call it growing pains, but shedding and evolving my relationship with alcohol has been very eye-opening for myself. Um, it's been interesting to see who I am on the other side of all of this and to sort of understand how I've been using it and, and also how I've been in denial. We've talked a lot about my growth and things I've gone through the years and we're going to get into it on another um, grief survival guide, which I will continue to add to. It's been a little bit of time, but we were going to have the former Wisconsin governor on the podcast, Marty Schreiber, who wrote a book called My Two Elaine's, which was about his wife who was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and, and his dealings with the disease. And, and um, we were going to discuss, you know, that whole situation, but obviously all the things that I've been through, uh, I've been going through an evolution and I've been very open about it, but I've also expressed my, my inability to see my own depression and what I was experiencing going through loss and grief. And we'll get into that, into that episode with Marty, when we record, we were going to record last week, but he was visiting his daughters and didn't have really good Wi-Fi, so we we paused the recording and and uh, I look forward to rescheduling and getting him on the podcast because his book was uh, beautiful. It's called My Two Elaines. Pick it up if you're somebody who's dealing with someone with Alzheimer's, uh, somebody who's diagnosed with Alzheimer's, or if you are a caregiver. It is a really informative book on how to care give for a love a loved one, which is such an expensive experience emotionally, physically, and financially, one of the most expensive experiences and events that you can go through, not without its own trauma. But um, that being said, I think the whole point is my relationship with alcohol has evolved as I've evolved through all these different scenarios and sort of becoming aware and self-aware to my own depression has made me want to not put things into my body that can trigger that depression. And obviously alcohol is a depressant. So, um, in moderation, and I was never somebody that really wanted to say that, but Hey, you know, it's not everything in moderation and you have to be very careful about what you're putting in your body. As I sip on this gluten reduced beer. Hmm. But I feel powerful now. I feel like, a a completely different person. Not that I was dependent on alcohol, but I just was a little reckless with it and letting it show up to parties that it didn't necessarily need to be invited to like 8 a.m. shot in the morning on Thanksgiving. Did I, did I need it? That's I think that was an old phone call that I answered from an old friend. We don't need to pick up those phone calls all the time. Let them go to voicemail. But um, that's uh, I guess we went on a long diatribe about why I was so sexy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get another question. Sad boy Shinobi. Boy Shinobi. Sad boy Shinobi. That's a interesting. I'm probably saying it wrong. Three favorite cereals. This is important, doctor. God, this is really important. I actually pulled up a little list because I had a hard time with this question. Your three favorite cereals. Now, I don't know if any of you are who I was as a child where I would go to the grocery store with my mother. I would volunteer to go to the grocery store with her. One, I loved spending time with her. Two, the cereal aisle. Epic. The cereal aisle was an aisle of endless possibilities. It was a world tour for your childhood palate. Everything had flavors from all over the world. Just really, that they should have, you know, where they have those like, foreign food aisles that should be the cereal aisle Th these aren't even lands that are on the planet 
These are Middle Earth lands that these flavors came from. This is not, you know, the flavors of Siam. This is fucking Narnia. We need our own descriptive aisle, okay? Back up, turmeric. I'm goddamn Lucky Charms. Have some fucking respect. Captain Crunch, move over, Bergamot. Captain Crunch is in town. We don't have time for you, okay? Time? We don't have time for time. This is a serious situation. I loved this cereal aisle. The, the possibilities were endless. It just felt like whatever my heart desired, the cereal aisle was going to answer. And my mom would save it for the end. She would save the cereal aisle for the end, probably as a behavioral tactic, very smart for Nancy, but also because she knew I enjoyed it and it took me forever to make a decision. I think the cereal aisle at Wegmans on Pond Street on the north side of Syracuse, New York, is where my option paralysis began, where I realized the difficulty of having too many decisions made me make very few decisions to the point to where my mom would be like, all right, we got to go, and she'd just grab a box, and I'd be like, fuck, because it was like Cheerios, a bullshit cereal. Cheerios is like if somebody took cardboard and folded it into a sad, a sad floaty nobody wants to sit in, a teeny floaty. That's Cheerios. Cheerios can go fuck itself. The worst cereal ever. It's like, it's like a cardboard. That's what it tastes like. There's so many great flavors. I couldn't, this, this question really tripped me up. Sad boy, Shinobi it really fucking tripped me up. And, and I sat on it for a couple of days so much so that I actually Googled and did some research on this. Um, so there's this one list here, 20 best breakfast cereals ranked. And I knew I didn't trust it because number one is Annie's homegrown. Now, nothing against Annie's homegrown. It's an organic line, very colorful, um, sweet, healthy cereal. We don't have time for healthy cereal. He didn't say three healthiest cereals. He said three favorite cereals. And there's no place for the Kashi bullshit on this list. Take your Kashi dream and shove it up your ass because this is, this is a cereal station and we don't fuck around. All, all that being said, if Annie wants to sponsor the podcast, we will, we will take that into consideration. Uh, Annie's is, is 20, 19 is Kellogg's crisps. Now if it crispix, if you remember Kellogg's crispix, it was, it could be a fun cereal. It could be a fun cereal because it had all those like little nooks and crannies and the little shapes you could, if you put sugar in, the sugar could get stuck in there or honey. So Crispix needed accoutrements. You couldn't just eat it alone, but all, it, is it the, one of the three favorite cereals? No, absolutely not. Is it even in the top 10, top 10? You're out of your mind. There's no way the cereal is even on the list because it needs accoutrements and anything that needs accoutrements to me, it doesn't even have come to the, the table. It's not, it shouldn't even be in the house. 18 is Rice Krispies. Now Rice Krispies is one of those cereals. That's a sneaker. I don't mean like a shoe. I mean like a creeper. It sneaks in because Rice Krispies has a trick up its sleeve and it's called Rice Krispie treats. You can't make Crispix treats. I mean, you can, you can make any type of treats, but it's not going to be as good as Rice Krispie treats. And that's where Rice Krispies may be able to be in the top three fave because it also is a dessert if it wants to be. And it's a conversation. The cereal talks to you. And that just is probably for all the latchkey kids growing up. Somebody made the cereal because mom finally got a job. So somebody needed to talk to the kid in the morning. Enter Rice Krispies, a conversation for your lonely child. That's what Rice Krispies was. It wasn't a cereal. It was a sibling. <laughs> I laughed at that. I didn't need to, but it really made me laugh because it's so true. Snap, crackle, and pop. Is that your cereal? No, it's Cindy. She's at the table with me because mom and dad have to work. So Rice Krispies, I think we can keep it on the list. It's it's kind of, you know, uh, it, it's it's a swinging door. We'll call it a swinging door. Someone on this list put kind cereal. Get the fuck out of here. It's the same as, as Annie's. Special K. Special K was trash. It, it literally it tasted like you were eating soggy trash with little bits of crunch. Special K doesn't count. It needed accoutrements and it can fuck off. Cheerios can fuck off. Ugh. 
what the fuck? I don't care how many, uh, what percent of whole grain it is. It's a hundred percent bullshit. Talk about needing accoutrements. Oh, and now they slap gluten-free on the cover of the box. General Mills, how dare you? It's free of everything. It's free of fun too. Underneath gluten-free, you should put fun-free as well. No fun in that fucking bowl. Just a reminder that you're broke as shit. I can't get a lick of, of sugar. I got to go to the cupboard and open up another attachment and sprinkle something on this cereal to make it somewhat edible. Fuck you. Fuck you for making me work for this. Mm-mm. Cheerios can go fuck itself. That's it. OK, now we're getting into some fun stuff. Honeycomb. Honeycomb brings back a lot of fun memories. Captain Crunch. OK, now it t- but this list is bullshit. It took them a while to get into the fun. They also have cashy cornflakes fucking nature's path in the top 10. You can kindly fuck off as my friend, Jimmy Wisman says. So then I found another list and I knew it was my list because this is the top 20 best breakfast cereals ever at number 20. We got fucking fruit loops. Hell yeah. Starting strong. What flavor do you want? We got fucking all of them. Wrap it up. We got them all. We got them all. (laughs) Fucking, that was me doing, trying to do one of those whistles. (laughs) Wrap it up. We got them all. All your flavors in one fucking bowl. Fruit Loops, absolutely. Strong lead in. I I was actually shook by number 19. Boo Berry. Release date, 1973. 1970s gave birth to a lot of great music, a lot of fun drugs, and probably a few diseases we didn't see coming. But lest we forget Monster Booberry on the shelves for your children's viewing and flavor pr- pleasures, probably with chemicals and uh, different colors that cause all sorts of issues with children. Slap it in the bowl, put it in the mouth, call it a breakfast. Delicious. 18, coming in at 18, Cocoa Puffs. Are you cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs? Because I know I'm cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Coming in hot. It's not just a cereal. It's also a drink. You'd eat the cereal. You get chocolate milk. How many of your cereals has gifts at the end of it? Not many. Not many. I'll tell you that much. It does say whole grain guaranteed. Not necessary. It's a, it's a see, when, when breakfast cereals put things like calcium and vitamin D and whole grain. It gives me the same feeling as when I'm watching football so infrequently. And I see those messages on the backs of the helmets. I don't want to be reminded of of the betterment of society. I just want to, I want to escape into trash once in a while and not be reminded that I need to, you know, choose this and choose that and, and have vitamin D. Let me just escape into nothing for a while. Okay. You're causing me stress. My cereal and my football shouldn't be stressful. 17, honey smacks. Wrap it up. We're shutting it down. This list does not fuck around. This list basically is the cereal aisle. It's got me hyped up. Honey smacks with that hip hop frog on the front. Fuck you. I don't even know. Dig them. That was a fu- That was a frog. Dig them. Remember dig them with the sideways cap. That motherfucker fucks. That frog fucks. We got 16 Reese's Puffs. What a deep cut. See, we thought Reese's Puffs was just going to be like a highlight cereal, like a special in and out seasonal situation. Not even seasonal, just like a a limited edition cereal was so popular that 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 fucker stayed on this on the aisle. And then back to to my conversation, number 15, Rice Krispie Treats cereal, which is a big hell no for me. This is the equivalent of when shows try to do spinoffs, except for like Better Call Saul. Save your spinoff. We don't need the spinoff. Let let the classic stay classic. Okay. We can't have the dessert become a cereal because then you fuck it all up. You're ruining it. Stop giving everyone a show. Not everyone deserves a show. Let them just be in the sideline. Let them be in the background. Okay, we don't need... Look, Beyonce was the only one who needed to come out of Destiny's Child. Kelly Rowland's really talented too. And I wish Michelle the best. 
Number 14, honeycomb. To me, honeycomb is, is a staple. If we're going to say three favorite cereals, honeycomb may need to be in the top three. 13, cookie crisp. Woo! See, this is where desserts and cereal, the marriage of that became magical. This is where that could only really work besides Reese Pieces. Cookie crisp, what a way to get your kid in the fucking store with you. If you don't shut up, you're not going to get a bowl of cookies for breakfast. And we wonder why we have attention issues. We were eating different, all this whole aisle was just sugar in different shapes. A bowl, we would eat a bowl of chocolate chip cookies and go to school. That's like something that Elf eats. You remember Elf with, with Will Ferrell, the food he was making? That's what we grew up on. 12 waffle crisp. Now waffle crisp can be a room divider. I I feel like that's a political conversation and I don't know that waffle crisps really has a place here. I feel like waffle crisps, you know, it depends. It's like, is it, does it really taste like a waffle? Does it have that weird fake taste? And, And let's be real. Let's keep waffles waffles. We don't really need the waffle to be a cereal. Waffles are great on their own. We don't need to crisp them up and add milk. You're just fucking up the waffle at that point. You're diluting the waffle. Let's not do that because the waffle's so delish. Mm. See what else we got? Let's run through a couple. Fruity Pebbles, love it. The greatest mush your mouth will ever have. Quisp, OG, 1965 cereal, surprisingly delicious. Quisp was like a sleeper as well. That hit your flavor profile and you were shocked that it came with any punch because it looks like nothing. It's like that little cute Jewish kid that's got some game on the court and shocks everybody. You're like, where the fucker come from? Um, Golden Grams? <laughs> Golden Grams, to me, it's, it doesn't, it, it's not as good as its cohorts. It doesn't hold up. Corn Pops? Absolutely. See, I think honeycomb, honeycombs and, 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 and Corn Pops to me, corn pops were like two different cereals in one. You had to eat it really quick to get the crunch. But then once it became mushy and kind of mushy, it was really delicious. And it came out in 1951. Are you kidding me? It's like the Aretha Franklin, a cereal. I, I don't know when Aretha Franklin was born, but she's also dead. I'm pretty sure Aretha Franklin's dead, right? Everyone's dead. Um, but it, it, the point is, is that it's a classic and it's a queen and it's a diva. And no one's taking it from me. Apple Jacks. Apple Jacks is solid. That's a solid cereal. We're at number seven, Apple Jacks. Number six, Honey Nut Cheerios. Now that would infuriate me, but I will say Honey Nut Cheerios is an OG. We must respect it. It is basically kind of like the, um, I'm going to say, it's kind of like the Beastie Boys of cereal. You got to respect it. It's got street cred. It's been around for a while. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of an outlier, but it's also classic. So we got to keep it. Crunch Berries. It's fucking solid. A little exotic for the top three. I'm, I'm, I want to go classic on the top three. Now, Honey Bunches of Oats was basically a salad. <laughs> when I think of the cereal aisle, I, on, as a kid, honestly, I thought Honey Bunches of Oats was, was like produce. Like this is too healthy. Meanwhile, it just was more dense chunks of sugar. But I was for sure certain that it was, I thought it was broccoli. I'm like, this is broccoli. It's delicious broccoli, but it's broccoli nonetheless. Number three, Frosted Flakes. When I think of my childhood, Frosted Flakes is always around. It's always around. It's a classic cereal. And and Tony the Tiger was, that's my homeboy. He's one of my first friends. Tony the Tiger and and, and, and Rice Krispies, we'd all hang out. We'd all hang out while Nancy worked. Number two, Lucky Charms. Fuck. If you didn't take a bite of Lucky Charms and think that you had the future in your hands, if you didn't take a bite of Lucky Charms and, and think all of your dreams are going to come true, you, you weren't living right. I took a bite of Lucky Charms and I thought for sure all my dreams are going to come true. And look at me now. I'm here because of Lucky Charms. Number one on this list, and this is why this list just sits with my heart, Simon, Simon and Toast Crunch. You get a Rudy clap. Sim, cinnamon Toast Crunch to me is one of the best cereals. It's also one of the most fattening cereals. And I only remember that because I wanted to know why it was so delicious. It's got like 3.5 grams of fat per serving. 
delicious cereal, the crunch, the cinnamon, the, the, the magic, the mystery, the swirls, the twirls, the twists, the turns. Where are we going to go next? We don't know. Hop on the spoon. The this, this spoon's going to take you to a magical mystery tour in your mouth. And it's never going to end. And it never has end for me. Has never ended. I, I think about cinnamon toast crunch and once in a while. I, it's been a while since I've had cereal like this, but when I'm really stoned and I hit up the cereal aisle as an adult, I'd go right for a box of cinnamon and toast crunch. Not going to lie. But I will say to answer your question, sad boy Shinobi. After all of this, you obviously hit, struck a nerve. You struck a real nerve and you struck such a nerve that I don't even think we're going to be able to get to the rest of the questions. But my top three favorite cereals in somewhat of a particular order, honeycombs, corn pops, cinnamon toast crunch, cinnamon toast crunch being the best. But I will say that I will interchange Apple Jacks and Frosted Flakes on the odd days just so I get a little, I like a meze. I'll put this list in the description of the notes. I also will include the mate choice copying in the notes as well. And uh, let, let, let's get a, let's get a couple more questions here. Um, let, let's lighten, let's lighten the mood to co coming from that. It's a little heavy, right? We got, we got, we got a little bit heavy here. John B. McMasters, who asks questions sometimes has been an OG fan. How you doing, John? He asks, my wife hasn't liked sex in years. She only has it because I want it. Not fun. What do I do? Damn. Well, I wanted to lighten the mood and then that popped in. There's, there's a lot, a lot going on there. I, I don't know if we touched on this question. We may have touched on it before. I don't know if you've asked this question a couple times. It sounds kind of familiar. I would say do something different. Do something fun. Do something you guys haven't done before. Take a risk. You know, do something that you're scared of and, and find a place where you guys can learn something together. You know, I think we're such a orgasm focused creature that we forget that there's fun in climbing to climax. Maybe try to find fun climbing to climax instead of the climax ex itself, first of all. And second of all, if your wife hasn't liked sex in years, that's a conversation to have. You may need to have a conversation first. Who knows what she's going through? There's a multitude of reasons why people evolve their relationship with sex. You know, we, we, we're talking about relationship evolutions and the changes in our relationships. Well, people can have an evolving relationship with sex, depending on what they've been through, especially women, especially women, our connection with sex and our evolution of our hormones and who knows if you have children and what that does to you. And there's just so many different obstacles that women experience. And I'm not saying men don't, I'm only speaking from my experience. Maybe this is, a, requires a conversation before anything and try to have some empathy. Imagine not wanting to have sex. You know, the other option and, 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 you know, probable reason is an extramarital situation. I, I hate to be the, you know, don't shoot the messenger. Is it possible that she is getting it from someplace else? Or if she doesn't like it at all, then that's another conversation. Maybe something happened in her past and she's being triggered. But I think you guys need to have a conversation. Life is way too short. And if she's your wife, that means you love her. And if you love her, have some empathy and, and open up the floor for her. Make, get, get her into a space where she can feel safe to just have an easy conversation, just an easy conversation about, Hey, what's going on? Maybe her evolution with sex is, is something, maybe it's a change in your relationship. Maybe her relationship with your relationship has changed and she doesn't know how to bring that to the table. Either way, I know for sure in my little short time on this earth, that the less we talk, the more problems we have because we make assumptions and assumptions lead to resentment. And that's not fun for anybody. And wherever there is discomfort, there is truth. So you have to follow that. You have to believe that when you're feeling uncomfortable, that you have to keep going because you're going to unlock the truth about the situation. You're going to find the answers in there. It's like the dark forest. You got to go through the dark forest and the dark forest 
being your past and your trauma and whatever it is, you have to not be afraid to venture into the unknown and into the discomfort because that's where all the answers are. And hopefully she can have an awareness of that and and that you guys can come together and are able to have an adult conversation where we're not finger pointing, where we're not attacking. I'm not a marriage therapist. I don't think I know everything. I'm only speaking from my heart and from experience and, and what I feel for you in this moment. I've certainly had my handful of issues and have come from a broken home. And that's why I feel like I can give some sort of insight to this. But having a conversation is the most important. Forget the sex. The sex should be fun. And sex is never going to be fun if there's the thing that's not being spoken about. Whatever is not being said is the thing that needs to be said. So find out what that is. And, and your answer will be there. In the worst case scenario, your, her answer isn't you. And there's some freedom in that. We can't be afraid to lose. We can't be afraid to lose in this scenario. You have to go in knowing you're going to lose something. You're going to lose some perspective. You're going to lose a little dignity. You might lose some hope, but you will gain, pers- you will gain perspective. You will gain dignity and you will gain hope on the other side of that. It's like when you relinquish your control to the scenario, you, you, what you get from it is, is tenfold. So I hope that um, on the other side of this, you guys are able to have a conversation and you're also able to come. A conversation. I wish that for the both of you. And um, I thank you guys for listening. There's more questions. We'll have to save those for the next episode. Dr. P, you can submit your questions to my Instagram page on Sundays and Mondays on my Instagram story. And if you want to email them, email them to me, Jesse May Peluso Comedy at Gmail. And oh, my news, my exciting Netflix news. My show is premiering in March. My Netflix show is premiering in March. I'm so fucking excited. And we're also starting to move along with my comedy special. And I, I can't wait to share both of those things with you guys. Um, I will be doing probably a bunch of podcasts promoting both of those. And I just appreciate you guys so much for listening and tuning in every week, sharing this with your friends and being a part of my May Bay community. I love you guys so much. And I, I wish you some evolution in your own relationships. 